Good morning. I'm James Matson, and with me are Linda and Nick, and we welcome you to our seminar this morning. I also want to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Enora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. A few housekeeping matters to begin with. If you have any questions throughout this seminar, please feel free to use the chat function and send us the questions and we'll do our best to answer them. It's also going to be the case that after today's seminar, we will be sending out a copy of the slides to everyone and the recording will be available within the next few days to view. We will also be asking at the end of today's webinar to complete a short survey on the presentation. Today we have decided to talk about misbehaviour. Can employers set and enforce the standard? And certainly we have not seen any drop in misbehaviour during this COVID environment. And I have had the experience of seeing this new way in which we interact and the new technology that we're using lead to some interesting situations. I even had the occasion to look at a case of an employee who on MS Teams left their laptop but still had their microphone on and went to the toilet during the meeting. And despite people working out what was happening and saying, hey, you still got your headset on, they said, well, I'm at home and I can do what I want and then went on and delivered a message that no one wanted to hear. And the question was, was that misconduct? Human nature is fantastic. We do weird and wonderful things. And I don't think misbehaviour is ever going to disappear. Today, we want to talk about the language of misconduct, provide you some guiding principles, for dealing with serious misconduct. And we would also like to talk about, in the main, a number of case studies, which will be designed to give you a flavour for how different types of misbehaviour are dealt with. And we'll conclude with some tips and takeaways and some key lessons. No doubt misconduct does cover a multitude of sins. Um, and it also is plagued by a range of different language, which can be quite confusing when looking at misconduct. And people use different language to justify their position. There's language of serious misconduct, there's language of repudiation, summary dismissal. Case law talks about willful or deliberate misconduct, repugnant, gross incompetence, gross negligence. And there's many other types of language that is used in an attempt to try to describe misconduct or serious misconduct. And that can lead to things being quite confusing. So we're gonna to try to break that down by just dealing with the topic on a much more simplistic level. It is important that we keep in mind that there are different schemes and there are different concepts at play um, when we are talking about misconduct and, and wanting to terminate, there's contractual principles, there's the Fair Work Act, one needs to keep in mind for those within the federal jurisdiction and those within the state system, there's particular legislation relating to how things operate at the state level. When we're talking about contract and termination, there's either termination on notice or termination summarily without any notice because the conduct is of a significant and serious nature. And there what the courts tend to talk about is a very serious or fundamental breach of an express or implied term of the contract, such as the duty to act with fidelity and good faith. Or they talk about a repudiation of the contract where a party evinces an intention that they're not gonna comply with the terms of the contract. The Fair Work Act relies on those concepts when talking about serious misconduct, but it also does go to the effort to describe 
and to list some circumstances where termination for serious misconduct and avoiding the obligation to provide statutory notice can exist. Some of those are things such as theft, fraud, assault, intoxication where one is so impaired, disobedience and conduct which is serious and creates an imminent risk to health and safety or the reputation of a business. But what we also know is that under the um, Fair Work Act is that you can also terminate on notice. Certainly you, you can do so for a valid reason, which is an important concept which exists under the federal unfair dismissal jurisdiction, but it does also exist um, in the state system as well, in the sense that any reason for termination needs to have some sound basis in fact. By way of a short overview, it, there are some important guiding principles when it comes to dealing with summary termination, which is worthwhile to keep in mind. Certainly, if an employer is ever ending employment by reason of serious misconduct, the burden of proof, in other words, having to establish that it occurred, is on the employer. And the courts describe that as a heavy burden and a finding that they won't make lightly largely due to the financial and reputational consequences for an employee in respect of who that finding is made. Courts have been clear over the years that an isolated act will rarely justify summary dismissal unless there is some real serious consequences. And you can't avail yourself of the ability to summarily terminate without notice just because there's some uneasiness. There, there needs to be some real significant consequences. Other than that, there's no law that defines the degree of misconduct that's required. It will often be a matter of impression and it can vary from different judges, different courts and tribunals. But what they're really looking at is what's the gravity of the conduct and the consequences. And we'll go through some case studies that deal with that today. Um, it's also worthwhile to keep in mind that if you are in the jurisdiction of an unfair dismissal, certainly the um, Fair Work Commission has made clear that what you do need to show under that legislation is whether there is a valid reason for dismissal. That doesn't mean you've got to show that there was serious misconduct, just that there was a valid reason. Then under other criteria, the Commission will take into account if there was a dismissal without any payment of notice, whether or not that's a relevant matter, whether or not that makes the dismissal harsh, unjust or unreasonable. And it's also worthwhile to keep in mind when we look at these cases is that the Commission does really dislike with a passion um, having any set rules that say, well, if you do this, it's automatic dismissal and that will always be the case. Um, the case of Australian Postal Corporation we got there involved pornography. Um, the argument was made that, you know, if you send or distribute pornography in the workplace, it must result in automatic dismissal and the Commission made it clear that there are no set rules and individual circumstances can lead to different outcomes. That's important to keep in mind, particularly when facing an unfair dismissal. So these are the cases we want to talk about today. Um, we're going to go through them one by one so that way you can get a flavour of what are the trends, what are the approaches, what are we seeing um, today in respect of how courts and tribunals address um, misconduct in the workplace. Now, I want to begin by asking Nick to tell me the old fashioned fight, the old fashioned Barney that can occur amongst colleagues and in the workplace, I recall have had mixed results for employers, at least historically. But I want to know, Nick, is a tougher approach being taken these days? Yeah, it's a good place to start, James, because it's a black and white area that is decidedly grey. And that's because the Commission is looking for something more than the conduct itself. It's looking beyond the conduct to understand what really happened um, there are a range of factors that, that are going to be considered, you know, 
the facts giving rise to the assault? Was there provocation? How did it arise? What's the context uh, between the parties in the workplace? And then after you deal with all of those things, you're going to be looking at the, the factors that need to be taken into account in relation to the individual, their seniority, the, the position, uh, and any other proportional issues, you know, whether or not the employer had um, expectations and those kind of things. So it's a really good place to start. And, and the case that I'm going to take you to is a case called Eparama. Now, Eparama is a really interesting case. Um, it's a New South Wales Industrial Relations Commission case. Mr. Eparama was a senior corrective services officer and he assaulted a detainee. He assaulted the detainee by striking him. It wasn't very um, clear from the footage, but it was somewhere between nine and 11 times to the head and the torso. Um, and he did that after pushing the detainee a couple of times. The detainee was handcuffed at the time. And the reason Mr. Eparama struck or assaulted the detainee was because the detainee spat in his face. Corrective services terminated Mr. Eparama's employment for misconduct. Um, and Mr. Eparama appealed that decision. It was a public sector appeal, but essentially the, the same principles of unfair dismissal applied. So um, the conduct was established. There was no doubt the video footage showed that uh, Mr. Eparama had assaulted the detainee who was handcuffed at the time. He would pushed him into the wall and, and hit him somewhere between nine and 11 times. Um, Mr. Ambarama said it was unfair because he'd had 26 years of service. He'd had only two reprimands. And he relied on the fact that his son had a compromised immune system and him being spat on and the risks to his health brought considerable risks to his son. He also said that based on the provocation and the fact that he was remorseful and showed contrition, the response from the employer to terminate him was disproportionate in the circumstances. He was a sole breadwinner and he had limited job prospects outside corrective services and uh, given the assault and the criminal charges that were brought, um, he was likely to lose his security license. Now, the respondent simply said, well, you can't lose it because a detainee spits on you, you're in a position of power and authority and uh, you can't just black out um, because someone does something and we've got no confidence that if a similar incident happened in the future, you wouldn't respond in the same way. Um, they also relied on a prior incident some years before where he was spat on and responded in a similar way. Um, they said he showed a lack of remorse. Um, and there was some talk about a false statement in relation to the, the assault. Now, Mr. Eparama was convicted in the district court. Well, he was charged by police and pleaded guilty. Um, he No conviction was recorded. He was given a, a, the equivalent of a community service corrections order. Um, so the question is, was Mr. Eparama's appeal successful? Did he succeed? Was his dismissal unfair? And the answer is, well, no, um, but it was because the commission held that his actions in assaulting a detainee who was under his care constituted a gross breach of the duty of care owed to the prisoner by the state. And the commission said the prisoner was effectively defenceless because he was handcuffed. And while the detainee was obviously defiant and he had provoked Mr. Eparama, Mr. Eparama's response was so disproportionate and dangerous that it was unnecessary. So what the commission said is even take into account his unique family circumstances, uh, there are just no factors which justify his actions. He was experienced employee. And this is where that idea of experience can go the other way. You know, he should have known better, 26 years of service. And he was in a position of leadership and his conduct fell well short of the standards expe expected. So 
in this case, the Commission said it was an especially serious form of misconduct and they upheld the decision to dismiss Ephraim. So that's one where the employer was succeeded. And, 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 and certainly he had options available to him rather than punch the um, person who he had to care for nine or 11 times, as you indicated. Now, Linda, bullying and sexual harassment are certainly um, hot topics. And certainly everyone's a lot more aware of that sort of behaviour being abhorrent in the workplace. What trends are we seeing from the Commission in supporting employers to actually take decisive action against these bullies and harassers? Well, what we're seeing in recent case trends before the Commission suggests that there's a low tolerance for this type of conduct and employees are entitled to expect appropriate workplace behaviours from their staff. And this is seen in uh, some recent decisions, but in Heesum and Vegco, Proprietary Limited Trading as One Harvest, it's a 2019 decision before Fair Work. The applicant, Mr Heesum, was employed by Vegco in its Fresh Cuts Packing Department and his employer received a number of complaints alleging that he had made inappropriate comments to co-workers. After an investigation, VegCo concluded that he had asked a female colleague for a kiss and that he had said to another co-worker that he wanted to get his sister. So the female colleague didn't report the incident because she wasn't overly offended by it. And at the time, Mr. Heeson was on an absolute final written warning um, as a result of the con conduct, he was summarily dismissed and the Fair Work Commission upheld the summary dismissal for serious misconduct and held that the fact that the female colleague didn't report the incident, didn't diminish the seriousness of the conduct, uh, they held she should not be put in the position where she needs to contemplate whether to make a complaint, she deserves to come to work and be treated with respect. And further, even if there had been no code of conduct or disciplinary policy, an employee should not have to be told to treat his fellow co-workers civilly. Now the conduct which Mr Heeson was found to have engaged in would, even without the code of conduct and disciplinary policy, have constituted misconduct and a valid reason for dismissal. The Commission held there's no place for bawdy, offensive, alpha male behaviour in the workplace and that the comments were highly inappropriate and deserving of censure. So Linda, are we seeing the Commission adopting a more realistic approach and not saying to employers, you need to have a policy covering every type of behaviour that is assumed that there's some basic respect and that everyone should know that? Yeah, that's right. Um, obviously, it's best practice for employers to have policies that address these types of behaviours. But as demonstrated by the Heaston case and this Nest case, the Commission accepts that an employer need not have a policy in order for employees to know that such conduct's not appropriate. Um, in Clark and Toll Transport, it's a 2019 case before Fair Work, the applicant was a 63-year-old male driver who exchanged a number of text messages with his 37-year-old male colleague. Uh, he texted his colleague calling him his bitch and a toy boy and then he threatened to molest his colleague and squeeze his little balls. The colleague complained quite rightly and the applicant was subsequently dismissed. The Fair Work Commission accepted that it need not only be a breach of company policies and procedures to warrant a summary dismissal or to warrant a valid dismissal. If an employer did not have policies, the conduct could still be regarded as inappropriate. Now in finding that the dismissal was unfair, the Fair Work Commission held that an employee of Mr Clark's age ought to know better than that. One can't text message a work colleague any message one likes if it breaches reasonable expectations of conduct. An employer is entitled to expect its employees will communicate with the workplace with appropriate levels of respect, civility and good conscience, not to harass, embarrass or intimidate. Um, and on this topic, we also wanted to flag the risk, risks of personal liability for employees who engage in this type of serious misconduct. And that can be seen in the recent case of Joseph and Parnell Corporate Services, which is a 2020 decision of the Federal Court, where not only was the summary dismissal legal, but the employee 
was ordered to pay an alarming $1 million in damages to the network. Thank you, Linda. Um, Nick, I think it, 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 it follows on from here that am I entitled or, or are workers entitled to give their boss a piece of their mind? Because surely management must have thick skins. Yeah, look, I think in the modern workplace, there is room for employees to express their views. Um, and, you know, the, the Commission has shown that it's willing to tolerate you know, what it describes as some robust discussion in the workplace. Um, but even when people are expressing their views in a forthright manner, there are lines which can't be crossed. And uh, this case on the screen of Charisma is a good example of where those lines might sit. So just really briefly, uh, Mr. Jones, he worked for the respondent um, as, a, as a shop fitter. He, he had, you know, he's normally out on site, but he had a history of some, I suppose, difficult interpersonal engagements is how they're described. Um, and in October of 2019, he had a heated exchange with the site foreman. And as a result of that, he was banned from the site and he had to work in the factory. So he's in the factory and he gets into a, a bit of an altercation with the supervisor who told him to do something and he ignored it. Um, and the supervisor escalated the ops manager and the ops manager and um, Mr. Jones engaged in a telephone call. Mr. Jones was asked to call the ops manager and that descended into a, quite an abusive phone call. There was yelling, there was swearing. Now, at one point in that robust discussion, robust discussion, Mr. Jones calls the ops manager an effing smartass and hangs up on him. The ops manager rings him back and says, oh, we haven't finished talking, but we seem to have got cut off. And Mr. Jones says, no, I hung up on you. And then they proceed to engage in another argument that continues on before Mr. Jones then hangs up on the ops manager again and then leaves. Now, the ops manager is furious. Uh, and between him and, and the director, they decide that that's enough. They decide to terminate. Mr. Jones immediately, they draft an email uh, terminating his employment and they flick that off. Um, and that's the end of Mr. Jones's employment. Now, Mr. Jones brought an application for unfair dismissal and the Commission had a look at this. Uh, and it was quite interesting. The, the Commission said, look, the failing to follow the direction, which sort of started the dispute, um, wasn't going to be enough to terminate Mr. Jones's employment but it was really overshadowed by the disrespectful behaviour on the telephone call. And what the Commission said is, look, calling your ops manager an effing smart ass and then hanging up on him, well, that's the line. You can't do that. That is disrespectful behaviour and that is a valid reason for dismissal. But there were some procedural problems, obviously terminating by email without any notice or discussion after he'd left. Um, the, the Commission wasn't happy with that process. So what the Commission said was reinstatement's not appropriate because the relationship had broken down and they awarded compensation. The Commission said had Charisma gone through a proper process, that would have taken about two weeks. So they awarded two weeks compensation, but then reduced that by 50% due to Mr. Jones's conduct. So in that situation, the disrespectful behaviour crossed the line and to get out of it for only $1,500 is not a bad outcome for an employer with those kinds of procedural problems. A small price to pay to stick up for culture. Thank you, Nick. I think certainly what both Linda and Nick were, were talking about there is that there is certainly a trend of the Commission sticking up for a good amount of civility and respect in the workplace and not tolerating behaviour, which may have in the past been viewed as perhaps employers being a little bit too sensitive, they are taking a stand because I think in this day and age, certainly respect, civility, politeness and professionalism are quite important. 
Now let's go to one of those real tricky areas, which is safety related dismissals, because historically there's been really mixed outcomes for employers. And even today, we still see mixed outcomes. Um, Nick, what can we take away from recent decisions dealing with safety misconduct? Um, again, it's one of these black and white areas that, that is not black and white at all. I think what we see, uh, James, is that the Commission is looking for something more than just whether or not there was a risk to health and safety, especially when that risk was relatively remote compared to the breach. So it matters whether or not there was a system in place, a system of working, whether or not there were policies and procedures in place and whether or not those those matters were clear, whether or not th th those matters were, were properly communicated and there was appropriate training. And then I'll also have a look at the, the incident itself and, and whether or not that the breach was actually serious. And you know what we see is there really is a difficulty where there are no injuries or adverse outcomes. You know, so, so it wasn't actually an incident and trying to, to demonstrate that those kinds of safety breaches warrant dismissal, especially when there's no track record or the employee has uh, you know, um, no other adverse outcomes on their, on their record, so to speak. So, Got a couple of examples here, um, which I think are recent, but, but they help set the scene for, for what we're seeing in regards to safety and where the Commission is going in regards to safety. I'll, I'll start with um, Knowles. So, so first of all, we'll have a look at what happened in Knowles, and then um, we'll have a look at some of the, the, of the cases which gave rise to, to the principles, and then, and, and then we'll see how Knowles went on appeal. So Knowles was a dispatch operator at Bluescape, that's essentially a forklift driver, and his role was to operate forklifts and heavy cranes to move very heavy steel coils within the warehouse. He performed that role for about 30 years. Now one day Mr Knowles hoisted the tongs of the crane without first rolling out or going down the length, long travelling they call it, the length of the coil to make sure that it was uh, safe and appropriate to do it. So, and in doing that, he'd failed to follow a critical safety procedure. And basically that procedure required him to run along the length of the coil to make sure it was safe to be lifted. Now, he was uh, dismissed for serious misconduct for failing to follow a critical safety procedure. And he filed an application for unfair dismissal. And Commissioner Reardon in this case um, in reviewing the reason for the dismissal, he formed the view that because there was no risk of the coil actually tipping, um, even though uh, Mr Knowles didn't long travel, didn't inspect it properly, um, there wasn't a valid reason for dismissal um, and ordered reinstatement. And Blue Scope appealed and in that context, what we're looking at is a clear procedure, a procedure that's in place because those calls are very he heavy. And if something did go wrong, people can be seriously hurt or injured. But nevertheless, the commission said, well, um, there was no actual risk of it tipping in this case. So it's unfair and we'll reinstate it. So that's where we are. Now, before we find out whether or not Bluescope was successful on appeal. Let, let's have a look at um, a, a case which helps set the, the scene for, for the principles. It's a case called Tom's. Now, Tom's, most people would know, it's a case from 2014, was a ferrymaster on Sydney Harbour. He was involved in an incident where the Marjorie Jackson, the, the ferry he was operating, um, collided um, with something. It was a minor collision. Tom's uh, was subjected to a drug and alcohol test and he tested positive. And Tom's employment was terminated for serious misconduct because he had breached the drug and alcohol policy. Tom's made an application for unfair dismissal and Deputy President Lawrence at that time 
held that the, while there was a valid reason, the failure to, to comply with the drug and alcohol policy, he decided that the dismissal was unfair and ordered reinstatement. Now, what Deputy President Lawrence said is, well, even though he breached the policy, he wasn't impaired. Um, so it was just an accident and he, he put him back on. Now, Harbour City Ferries appealed that decision to the full bench and, and the full bench gave some really helpful guidance for these matters. The full bench said, the lack of impairment arising from drug use and the absence of the link between the drug use and the accident are not relevant factors to ground misconduct as identified as not compliance. The fact is they had a policy and they required compliance with the policy because they don't want to have a serious safety incident. They're doing it as a preventative measure to ensure these incidents don't occur. It's a step in place. The policy was widely communicated. It's a principle that they have to ensure that they don't have incidents because the incidents can invariably be much more serious. So notwithstanding that the incident wasn't that serious and there's a question about impairment, there is an expectation that if you have a clear policy and you explain that policy and people understand that policy, um, then it will be a valid reason for dismissal. Now, um, Harbour City Ferries was successful on appeal. Um, the application was dismissed. Tom's did appeal, well, file an application for judicial review in the federal court, but that didn't displace the full bench's decision. And this is still good law in terms of uh, what to expect. What the commission expects is obedience with the policy. Commissioner now, Reardon didn't follow that, Nick. What happened in Knowles? Nah. Well, yeah, turning back to Knowles, that's a good point. What happened in Knowles was the full bench said, well, Commissioner Eden focused on because the, the fact that the conduct didn't cause the safety breach and there was no one in the line of fire, so to speak, it wasn't a, a serious incident. And they said, well, that's a serious error of fact. That is just not true. Uh, in finding that the, the conduct did not cause a safety incident, the Commissioner interpreted the policy to mean the fact that the the coil was at no risk of tipping meant that there was no safety breach. Now, that's completely not the case. Knowles admitted that he had not long travelled the, the coil. He knew the policy was in place. Um, he simply didn't do it. The fact that the, ch the chance of the coil tipping was low in this case was irrelevant. The reason you have these policies, these critical safety procedures, is to make sure that coils don't tip because if they do, someone can be killed. Um, so the full bench upheld the appeal and redetermined the matter themselves. And they held that there was a valid reason for dismissal, which was the breach of the policy and that the dismissal was not unfair. So thank that's goodness. really what they're looking for thank, there. That's thank, right, James. Thank goodness for that, Nick, because um, certainly it shows a lot more respect to the efforts employers put in, in developing safety procedures through risk assessments and indeed, no manager wants to be talking to a family about why someone was killed because someone just thought it was convenient to um, disobey a safety um, instruction that, that had been given to them. But safety, I suppose we are still seeing those mis mixed outcomes, which is an example of Commissioner Reardon's decision in Knowles. Um, moving on to a slightly different topic, um, I suppose there's so many workplace policies, um, Linda, in place that make it clear that you can't get sloshed at work functions. So surely if an employee at the Christmas party or at a client function um, gets drunk and embarrasses themselves and the company, the employer can take action against that? Well, yes, but um, it will depend on the circumstances because recent case trends suggest that single acts of active intoxication is not enough. Um, employer policies, um, while they should provide for discretion on individual circumstances, it's also really important 
for workplace culture and the approach to alcohol and how that will be a relevant factor as well. And so um, there's two cases that I wanted to run you through today in relation to intoxication and how the recent case trends of the Commission have been going. The first one is Willis, Australia Group Services, Proprietary Limited and Mitchell Innes. Um, this is a 2015 decision of the New South Wales Court of Appeal, but it's also quite relevant to intoxication um, as a type of serious misconduct. In this case, the applicant was an insurance broker at a staff training conference, and he engaged in conduct that included sleeping in the hotel foyer, attending the training intoxicated and speaking loudly and making animal noises during the training. Um, and he was subsequently dismissed for serious misconduct. Now, at first instance, the New South Wales District Court held that in order for Mitchell Innes's conduct to have warranted summary dismissal, it would have needed to have been of such aggravated character that it strikes the employment contract down immediately and permanently. It also went on to find that a proper reading of the contract of employment, including the employer's policies, read in the context of its practices in relation to alcohol, indicates that intoxication at work of itself is not sufficient to warrant summary dismissal for gross misconduct. Something more is required. Some aggravating conduct, such as repetition of the intoxication, a severe level of intoxication, adverse impact on employee or client safety, violence, offensive conduct or offensive language, a serious impact on reputation or significant financial loss. Oh, Linda, Linda, surely the animal noises were aggravating. It, this yeah. can't be the view yeah. today, can it? Well, the district court found in his favour awarding damages for wrongful dismissal. Um, the court also took into account the company's generally lax and in and tolerant nature towards alcohol in the workplace. It did go on appeal to the Supreme Court who upheld the decision and found that this isolated act seen in the context of the applicant's many good years of service did not satisfy the serious circumstances requirement to justify the applicant's summary dismissal. Uh, there was a similar decision that was considered by Fair Work um, in 2019. Uh, and that case is Trudy uh, Puska versus Ryan Wilkes Proprietary Limit. Limited. So in this case, the applicant was employed as a project administrator for Sydney Opera House's electrical contractor, Ryan Wilkes, and she attended a farewell drinks function for an employee of Sydney Opera House, which was um, her employer's major client. Uh, at this function, she became intoxicated and she was allegedly overheard insulting a colleague and employees of the client she was also alleged to have propositioned a client employee. She vomited and she had to be escorted to a taxi because of her intoxication. Now, Ryan Wilkes summarily dismissed her for serious misconduct based on her behaviour and her intoxication at that function. Um, however, the Fair Work Commission found that the dismissal was unfair and actually ordered reinstatement. And they held that on any reasonable and objective contemplation, single act of drunkenness at an after work function which didn't involve any abusive or aggressive behaviour and for which no serious risk to the reputation or viability of the employer's business could be established would not represent misconduct provided a sound defensible and well-founded reason for dismissal and interestingly they went on to say frankly if one act of inoffensive drunkenness at an after work function provided valid reason for dismissal I suspect that the majority of Australian workers may have potentially lost their job. Interesting. So certainly there's a right to drink and make a fool of yourself um, in Australia, perhaps. Perhaps I'm being a bit sarcastic. Um, I suppose, Linda, what's the view on dishonesty? That's a, a, a certainly an area of um, serious misconduct that gets a fair bit of attention. Yeah, and I think that um, unlike intoxication, dishonesty is definitely quite a serious matter. Um, as Justice Kirby said in the High Court decision of Concord and Worrell, it cannot be disputed, statute or express contractual provision aside, that acts of dishonesty or similar conduct destructive of the mutual trust 
between the employer and the employee once discovered ordinarily fall within the class of conduct which without more authorises summary dismissal. Uh, so obviously outcomes will turn on the circumstances though, so you need to take into account the gravity of the lie. Is it a small little fib or is it a sustained deception? Uh, maturity plays a role and when I think of maturity I think of a good case example is the case of the young man who worked at Hoyt's and he lied to protect Holly who had stolen some chopped off ice creams and they were worth about five dollars and then you compare that to the cases that I'm about to discuss where there's a sustained um, course of conduct. Um, you also need to take into account the impact on the trust and confidence between an employer and an employee. Now one particular type of dishonesty that's looked at pretty seriously is timesheet fraud which in our current COVID environment is relevant when you consider how many people or employees are working remotely. And the two cases that I'm highlighting today deal with time fraud as a type of dishonesty and serious misconduct. The first is Bryant and Southern Midlands Council and it's a 2020 decision of the Fair Work Commission. In this case, the applicant was an animal management officer with South Midlands Council um, and the Fair Work Commission was satisfied that the employee had engaged in time fraud which was in breach of the council's motor vehicle policy. What, what they found was that through GPS car records, it became clear that the employee extensively used the car, the council car for private use. She would arrive at work late, she'd finish work early and she'd visit her partner during work hours. Um, she had deceived the council and her actions were considered deliberate and willful. So the Fair Work Commission found that the dismissal was not harsh, unjust or unreasonable and determined that the applicant had willfully engaged in this conduct over a long period of time and therefore dismissed her unfair dismissal claim. Uh, the failure of the applicant to perform her, perform her job during work hours and instead spending significant amounts of the day's work hours engaged in personal activities um, where they were satisfied that on the evidence that she had engaged in a practice that was guilty of misconduct. And furthermore, the dishonesty of the applicant in misrepresenting to the respondent her activities over a long period of time was also misconduct. A similar case in Fair Work was in 2019, and that's Coombs and Sydney Water Corporation trading as Sydney Water. In this decision, the applicant was a senior asset information officer with a lengthy period of service of about 27 years. And he had previously been warned regarding his time and attendance and had received warnings not to tailgate, which um, what that meant was that he was tail tailgating out of the work gates, not using his access or swipe card. And he was doing this to have extra um, or long coffee breaks while attending work on time and leaving on time. Sydney Water subsequently terminated him for serious misconduct. And in this case, the Fair Work Commission also upheld that decision. Um, they, when they were considering the misconduct and his course of conduct, it was found that um, it was a calculated course of conduct consisting of multiple acts of dishonesty, disruptive of the mutual trust between the employer and the employee. And it falls within the class of conduct, which without more authorises a summary dismissal. Thank you, Linda. I think it's almost inevitable that we will get a case where someone is going to be challenging someone's work effort and output when working at home because they're, go they're going to collect or see um, one, not only a lack of performance and output, but also perhaps see that the worker is going out for coffees, catching up with friends for lunch, and engaging in other activities during the day. So I think it's inevitable that these issues will probably pop up in the current environment. So let's continue with the modern day. I think um, out of hours conduct is certainly um, a hot issue and has been for a number of years. And it really begs the question about whether you can misbehave in your private time or not and, and, and how that form of um, misconduct is being looked at by the Commission. Linda, any takeaways? Well, I think what we're seeing when it comes to out of hours conduct, conduct and the link or the connection to the workplace is where the conduct is seen as being as, as impacting on reputations and impacting on relationships 
um, if it's contrary to an employer's interest, if it's incompatible with an employee's duty, uh, is it affecting workplace cohesion and safety, and is there a derogation of corporate standards? And so the areas that we see it popping up in particular are work romances and personal opinions and criminal conduct, and to a lesser extent, questionable associations, secondary employment and social media activity. Um, now the interaction between out of hours conduct involving uh, social media and the workplace can be seen in the case of Luke Cole and Sydney International Container Terminals, Proprietary Limited. And this is a 2018 decision of the Fair Work Commission, but it's quite relevant to um, out of hours conduct and social media. In this uh, decision, the applicant was a stevedore and he was dismissed after sending pornographic video message to colleagues, including female colleagues using Facebook Messenger. Although the message was sent outside of work hours on a personal device. Um, now the respondent became aware of the message and they investigated. And notwithstanding that there was no complaint and that not all of the recipients were upset or offended by the message, it decided that the applicant had breached its policies with respect to bullying, harassment and sexual harassment. And the commission made comment on the respondent investigating without a complaint. And it, it said that while the case for the applicant was advanced as having at the heart of this matter, no employee had initiated a complaint about the applicant to the respondent, I have no hesitation in accepting that the respondent employer considers that if it learns of matters particularly including potential serious misconduct, sorry, serious um, harassment, that employer responsiveness is not and should not be considered necessarily to be contingent on having complaint having been made. The commission also summarised the legal position as follows. It said, if an employee engages in conduct outside of the physical workplace, towards another employee that materially affects or has the potential materially to affect a person's employment. That is a matter which legitimately may attract the employer's attention and intervention. The use out of hours, out of work hours of social media is one such example in the case of matters concerning bullying and sexual harassment. In this case, the commission held that there was a valid reason for the dismissal related to the applicant's conduct. Now, since that time, there's also been the cases of Fussell and Transport for New South Wales, which was a 2019 Fair Work Commission case. Um, and that was a case that concerned an unsolicited dick pic that was sent from one employee to another. And in that case, the dismissal was upheld by the commission who found that the applicant's conduct had been work related because he sent the picture to a colleague. There's also the decision in Nectaria Natoli, in Anglican Community Services, and that involved a threatening text messages and Facebook posts after the applicant's husband's car was damaged. The application was dismissed in this um, particular case as the commission found that the conduct was a breach of the employer's social media policy and the content and motivation of the text messages and Facebook posts were intended to scare, intimidate and threaten a staff member. Thank you, Linda. Um Everyone, you'll recall at the start that I spoke about misconduct covering a, a multitude of sins. And I spoke about there not being any degree of misconduct being defined or any hard and fast rules or categories being established. And that is in part for the reason that the law needs to be adaptable to deal with changing circumstances. And certainly that is very clear in this very recent case dealing directly with COVID where a uh, part-time catering assistant decided to cough in the face of a nurse that was taking his temperature on site when he began his shift in an aged care facility. Um, and there was no immediate apology for that behaviour, which one can appreciate impacts on safety, it impacts on respect, um, and it has a direct impact on the, the, the colleagues' well-being and what the um, aged care facility is intending to put in place. And the Fair Work Commission in that case was actually very critical of the applicant's behaviour um, in coughing in the face of the nurse, not apology, apologising and not realising that it was a serious incident um, and found that 
it actually meant it was untenable for this particular worker to continue employment in such an environment. So a simple thing as a cough has been found to justify uh, summary termination in that regard. So let's pull this all together with some tips and some lessons that can be taken away. Um, certainly, I think it, it's quite clear that employers can and you should set your standards in terms of the behaviours you expect and you should go through the process of educating and reminding um, staff about those standards. But what we've seen from quite a few cases is that you don't need to cover the field, you don't need to explain everything that can go wrong, and there are some basic standards of civility, professionalism and respect that need to be in existence in all relationships in the workplace. Do not be afraid to enforce your standards. And what we've picked up in terms of these decisions is that you can enforce your standards when there's not a complaint. You don't need a complaint to enforce the standards and you also don't need an incident. You, you don't need someone being injured or hurt or having a near miss to enforce your standards. And that's come out quite clear in some of those recent decisions. But ultimately we've got to keep in mind, particularly when it comes to looking at summary termination or an unfair dismissal is that looking at the conduct, is it serious enough? And the surrounding circumstances can be important. Certainly Nick and Linda have spoken about some surrounding circumstances, which make the conduct um, aggravating, which makes the conduct quite serious. For example, being in a position of trust, having other options in terms of how you respond to particular behavior. So that is quite important. Ultimately, you're going to have to determine as an employer what action you take, um, whether it's a warning dismissal or whether it's summary dismissal, or whether there is some other action you can take to set the standard. For example, public sector in particular sometimes has the option to demote or to impose a fine or take some other step to send the message that these are the standards that are appropriate for the workplace, but striking a balance in terms of what's fair or not fair. The other thing that's important to keep in mind when you are standing up for your workplace culture is that you've got to consider the consequences of terminating someone for misconduct and how you approach that. We've certainly seen cases where people view the conduct as quite serious, but decide to pay out the notice and then there's a claim, well, you've also got to pay me my long service leave for those between five to 10 years service. And sometimes it can be an inconsistent message. So you do need to consider the consequences of say giving notice versus the consequences of not giving notice, which will mean you, you will be held, held to a higher standard of proof. And that might come back to, well, what are we trying to achieve here by setting the standard, perhaps having a fight over four weeks notice and a little bit of long service leave, isn't worth it because what we really want to say is we removed the person for that conduct and we did so successfully. Ultimately, my one of my main messages is don't be afraid to stand up for your workplace culture. Be prepared to defend your decision because a lot of these tough decisions are challenged. But what we are seeing, at least in some of the areas, um, is that the Commission is adopting a, a little bit more of a realistic approach to these types of behaviours and the impact it can have on the workplace and it is going some way to assisting employers to set the standards. Um, intoxication certainly is an area where there's a slightly different um, view on things, but, but certainly um, it, it is leaning towards the side of employers where you are able to demonstrate that impact on the workplace. So I certainly do appreciate um, everyone's attendance today. I, I did want to leave a little bit of time for questions. So feel free to, to, to send them through now and we're 
happy to um, answer any questions now. Um, as I said at the beginning of the talk, these um, presentation slides will be sent out to everyone um, after today, and this recording will be available. Um, so feel free to um, let your colleagues know. Um, I'll just see if any questions come through. Otherwise, it's it's certainly much nicer when everyone's in one room. Um, there's no, oh, okay, so is it, we've got a question here. Are there other social media cases? Absolutely, there's a whole lot of social media cases and certainly the trend you see in those cases is that there is a um, move towards sticking up for employers, um, enforcing standards in respect to inappropriate activity on social media, but there is always the occasional pushback in terms of making sure that employers aren't oversensitive to what occurs on social media. Um, so that's certainly something worthwhile to, to keep in mind, but certainly in social media and that activity, we are seeing that there is a push um, more in favour of employers than employees, but certainly that's going to be an area that will continue to develop um, because I think misbehaviour in that forum is quite common. Um, we've got another question. So the employee who made the Hitler memi was awarded $200,000. I find this uh, appeal baffling, would be interested in the panel's view. So that involved, and this is where you get a little bit of the pushback and this is where context is important. Um, first instance decision, um, the commission found that making a memi of management in the famous downfall parody um, was a lack of respect and civility and the dismissal was justified for circulating um, that film on, on Facebook. Um, on appeal, the commission disagreed. They found the um, video of the downfall, um, in this case of management, to be a satire and found that it occurring in the context of some very tough industrial bargaining um, was not as serious as the company made out. And the company um, put on no evidence at all that that meme had any impact on the managers that were the subject of it or that they were offended, um, humiliated um, by that um, video. And as a result, the, the appeal panel found that it didn't constitute a valid reason for dismissal. I think if management did put on evidence of an impact to them, the outcome would have been different. The um, payment that was advertised of 200K just re reflected back pay in terms of the time that it had taken for the person to be put off. Um, I can say that there is um, a, a degree of conflict at present in terms of what conduct is acceptable in an industrial action, industrial bargaining context. Um, and that will play out in the coming years, but, but certainly, you know, the, the High Court has been critical of calling people scabs from the picket line. You can enforce that in terms of culture. This decision says it's okay to make a funny video. Um, I think the caveat on the appeal panel's decision is that it didn't hurt anyone. I think if there was evidence of that, it might have led to a different outcome. Um, now, uh, a, a question that we've been asked is, um, I work in the New South Wales state system. Are there similar trends in this space? Um, my view is, is yes, um, there are similar trends. Um, certainly, I think of 
Commissioner Sloan's decision to do with a 65-year-old worker uh, or 63-year-old worker involved in domestic violence outside of work, working for legal aid, and that dismissal was upheld as valid, even though it was out of conduct, and I thought that was a very mature decision. Um, Linda, I imagine um, you're seeing the, the, the same in the New South Wales Commission, that there is a degree of maturity creeping in in its decisions. Yeah, I agree. And Linda, we've, we've got another question. What about a falsified medical certificate? Would that constitute serious misconduct and a breach of trust and confidence? Well, I do uh, distinctly remember there's a case, I think it's the, um, it's, it might be a Fair Work Commission case or Federal Magistrates Court decision where an employee uh, called in sick and provided a falsified sick leave certificate to, I think, to attend the football. Um, yes. And he was, um, he was dismissed. And um, I think he ended up bringing an unlawful termination claim and he, that um, decision to dismiss him was upheld. So I think that there is a possibility if there is um, falsified medical certificate in those circumstances um, and you're able to establish that definitely um, trust and confidence is broken down. Yeah, and, 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 and it's a serious dishonesty. It's not a white lie, right. is it? Yeah. And another question that's come through, Linda, is, um, any advice regarding social media abuse of staff? Behaviour would not be tolerated if internal staff, however, how do you deal with abuse by the community directed towards staff? And I think that's a really hot topic, particularly given um, this current environment where people are perhaps stressed by things. Uh, any advice there, Linda? Uh, probably just to support your employees, I think, if it's um, external noise coming from the, uh, the community, the wider community and not your specific employees, um, I think it becomes a work health safety issue for your staff. Um, and it's important to make sure that they've got training to address those issues that are coming from the wider community and that they feel that they're in a position to respond um, appropriately to any uh, criticisms or complaints that are coming from uh, externals. Yeah, and I, and, and I think don't be afraid to go to the regulators if need be. Um, there's quite a few questions coming through, but I think we'll finish off with this question because I think um, it, it, it is important. Um, Linda, we've been asked um, any observations about managing employee misconduct in COVID times when they're working from home? Um, is there anything we can add in terms of that area? Um, from my point of view is I think, um, yes, with working from home and flexibility, but, but perhaps there's gonna be a degree of more tolerance in allowing people to attend to different um, uh, responsibilities when at home. For example, it might be picking up the kids, dropping them off, um, or it might be ducking out to get a coffee because it's not downstairs from the building anymore, but you've got to go into the main part of your, your, your suburb to get the coffee. I think it's about laying down the ground rules. Working from home doesn't necessarily mean you throw out the, you know, eight to three, nine to five, or whatever your customer service times are. It doesn't mean throwing that out. Sure, there will be some tolerance, but I don't think working from home creates um, open season for employees to just choose how they do things. And I think it, the, the, the clear thing there would be about setting your standards. Um, any other tips from your perspective, Linda? Look, I agree. I think that a lot of it is about flexibility, but, but, but trust as well of your employees. Um, but that being said, if there are occasions where it is a concern that there is some um, type of misconduct that's occurring while a staff member is working from home, then you are still within your um, rights and it's appropriate to be managing that staff in line with whatever policies, procedures that you do have. Just because they're not in the office doesn't mean that they're not on your time and your employee. So with that in mind, I can see that there's quite a few other questions and perhaps we will put them up with some very short answers and, and make them available in the coming days.
But can I thank everyone for attending? Um, have a great day, a fantastic weekend. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you.